Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today's program is given to you by a 6,000-hour pilot, someone who is not only a pilot, but a speaker, a writer, and a humorist. Mark Grady travels the country doing AOPA safety programs and other speeches of his own. And he has a very important program for you this morning, following and practicing emergency procedures. Please welcome Mark Grady. Thank you, Kathleen. Good to see you. And thank you. For those of you that are here in our live studio, welcome to Sun and Fun 2007. For those of you watching at home on the internet, all over the world, we're streaming at the FA Production Studios website. We welcome you here to Sun and Fun as well. Wish you were here with us. It's a beautiful day in Florida. And for those of you who are watching maybe by videotape, they're available for sale uh, after the program is over. Welcome as well. Well, we're here to talk about a couple of things today, mainly in the emergency procedures area. But before we do that, there's some folks who might want to thank thanks to the FAA safety team now called fast team uh, it's kind of made a transition in the aviation safety program and so we want to thank those folks and all these people in the studio today from OB Young who is the uh, director here at the FAA production studios this facility is used year-round not only to just do local safety seminars but also through the World Wide Web satellite broadcast are done here on um, the aviation uh, training network and all these folks here that are working at Sun and Fun are volunteers on the cameras up in our production studios upstairs. Let's give them all a hand for all they're doing here and spreading the aviation safety message. Uh, also, how many of you have been to fasafety.gov? Go do that. Get signed up for safety seminars that are coming up in your area. It's an important thing to do. And we know that the World Wide Web is a good way to distribute safety information to pilots. So with that in mind, let's go back to AOPA headquarters and see what the Air Safety Foundation is doing on the Internet to help spread the safety message. Let's take a look. Every pilot knows how important it is to stay current. But that's not always easy these days. With all the demands on your time, it can be tough to stay up to speed. Fortunately, staying current just got a whole lot easier. That's because the AOPA Air Safety Foundation has developed an easy to use website that puts all our resources right at your fingertips. www.asf.org is the source for busy pilots who want the best in safety education without all the hassle. You can take full FAA-approved online courses, test your knowledge with self-scoring quizzes, research accident reports, or catch up on the latest airspace changes right in your own home. And the best part is, it's all free. Let's take a look. Suppose you want to learn how to get the most from your handheld GPS. Just go to the online courses page and click on GPS for VFR operations. Or if your weather IQ isn't quite what it should be, you might want to check out our Weather Wise courses. They're designed to help you stay on Mother Nature's good side. Maybe you're a flatlander hoping to learn about mountain flying. Or maybe you'd like to know more about your airplane's engine, how it works, and how to keep it running smoothly. Whatever the topic, our easy-to-use online courses put the latest multimedia technology to work to get you up to speed. But that's not all. Our online accident database makes it easy to learn from others' mistakes. And because it's cross-referenced to AOPA's online airport directory, AOPA members can use the database to find out what kinds of accidents have taken place at their cross-country destinations. If you're looking for print publications, our entire library of safety advisors and special reports is online, too. Want to learn more about icing, avoiding thunderstorms, fuel management, operating at towered airports, it's all there. If you're taking instruction, you might want to check out our research on the truth about safety and in instructional flying, or maybe our report on the safety of technically advanced aircraft. We've even got downloadable flashcards to help you brush up on airspace or runway safety. Staying current is just as important as it ever was. And thanks to the AOPA Air Safety Foundation website, it's gotten a whole lot easier. www.asf.org. Give it a try. You won't believe what you've been missing. 
you've been online and taken one of our online courses, great. If you haven't, go there. We got a new one that's real popular called GPS for IFR Operations, becoming one of our most popular uh, courses online. So go take that as soon as possible. Something new to tell you about while you're here, and that is the AOPA Accident Forgiveness and Deductible Waiver Enhancement. Man, that's a mouthful. What is it? Especially if you're an AIG policy holder, listen up. They know that pilots who attend regular safety training are safe for pilots. So this seminar qualifies. How do you participate? If you're an AIG policy holder, here's what you do. Make sure you attend one Air Safety Foundation seminar at live or online every six months, and then you can print out a certificate and they'll give you an accident forgiveness and deductible waiver up to $100 in addition to the uh, accident forgiveness. So make sure you do that. You have to fill out a little registration card that are in the back on the table. Uh, the one here was, we have our road, road show seminars is kind of burgundy. The one in the back is blue so fill that out make sure you get that turned into us and don't forget AIG policyholders filled out turn in that registration card and if you like to find out more about this new program go to the internet at asf.org accident forgiveness and it'll tell you all about the program good to be back here and uh, we're here a couple of days ago and always always enjoy coming to Sun and Fun as Kathleen told you my name's Mark Grady and she told you I had 6,000 hours but what she didn't tell you because probably out of fear more than anything else Else, is that 6,000 hours? Most of that was in a Cessna 152. So you wonder why I'm this size. I, I used to be 6'8, 6,000 hours in that plane, airplane did this to me, but it was a lot of fun flying around. 150 and 152 is a great airplane. It's uh, perfect for the traffic watch business that I was in, perfect for uh, aerial photography, for example. Um, and you know, I think even uh, 152 is great for wildlife viewing as well, if you didn't know that. Matter of fact, uh, my son Michael, but back in North Carolina, is 12, and several months ago we were out flying around and he said dad look at your three o'clock he's got the lingo down now and i said, looked over there and there was a a goose a candidate flying right at that hour altitude and i just thought it was beautiful to watch it as it flew by and uh, that's just one of the things about a 152 you know it lasts a long time but going back to this aerial photography thing what's neat about the 152 and taking aerial pictures you get some beautiful ones in fact i was up flying not long ago and thought you might like to see some of the pictures i i took in the in the 152. Um, <laughs> I, you know, that, these were really a lot of fun to take. I asked for hire for this one. And you ever heard, and, and then ATC told me I had traffic at my two o'clock, look out the window, and this is what I saw. So it's just a lot of fun to fly that, that airplane. We're here to talk today about emergency procedures, though. I know that's extremely important stuff because you know what? The key to being a safe pilot is this. It's not knowing how to fly the airplane. It's knowing what to do when something goes wrong, right? And that's what we train and practice for over and over again. But you're going to hear in this seminar today that in some cases, we our training may get us in trouble. That some things we're taught to do maybe just don't go far enough into dealing with the human factors of flying to get us out of trouble if we're up there and getting a full-blown emergency in the airplane. What causes emergencies? All kinds of stuff. The number one cause is that fellow in the middle, us, the pilot. As uh, we talked about in an earlier seminar this week here in Sun and Fun, that 76% of the time we get in trouble in a particular situation in the airplane or have an accident, it is judgment related pilot error. So that's a little bit scary. But there's other factors from the equipment on board the airplane, the weather, uh, maintenance issues, all of these things can tr cause trouble in the aircraft, but the number one cause is pilot error. So things happen in the airplane. Let's get beyond the causes and remember that even if you're a good pilot who regularly practices things, bad things can happen to us. Complacency is a bad problem in that we have so many uh, situations where pilots stay out of trouble that when they do, they just don't think it's going to happen to them. So you still have to deal with the problem no matter what happens. First of all, let's clarify something. What is an emergency? This is important to clarify because there's a critical distinction between an abnormal situation and what is a full-blown emergency, and the context is everything. Matter of fact, I think in the um, one of the big Boeing jet manuals or something like, you know, maybe 40 or 50 official emergencies in their big giant POH of the aircraft, the official operating manual of that airplane, but there's several hundred abnormal situations. Um, 
even the situation or where they happen can make a critical distinction, right? Your altitude is a, is a major factor. The weather can be a factor in those emergencies. If you're over water or flying at night and our nighttime accident rate in general aviation isn't good, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Or if you're over terrain, the mountains, flying in the mountains, that's a different ball game. Or even if you're, you know, in other urban areas. That picture in the top right hand corner is always an interesting one to me because uh, I like to show that to non-aviation people and say, do you see the dedication of a corporate pilot willing to get his boss to the hotel on time? So that's, the, that's just these folks willing to do everything they can. But an emergency, unlike the abnormal situations, means there's a serious threat to our safety or the safety on the ground or people on board the aircraft, and it requires we do something usually quickly, but not rashly. Too fast a decision can cause just as much trouble, and the key to making sure we do it right is what? Anybody have a clue what that is? Good training. It is hard to convince pilots. We look at this biennial flight review that they call the flight review now as a test. Folks, that's bad stuff. We want to make sure we use it as an opportunity to remember to practice for these things because we never know when it's going to happen to us. Now, the abnormal situation, one critical distinction is it could be potentially dangerous, but it's not critical. Anybody ever had that happen to you in an airplane? The door pop open? Notorious on the 150 and 152, isn't it? And it's, it's you know, you get to the point that if it pops open a little bit in flight, it's no big deal to us. If you're especially if you're in a 150 or 152, but if you got a guy sitting in the right seat of that airplane with you who's never flown before, and he's gotten in the airplane, the door pops open. I've seen people slam their hands on the headliner, curl their toes over the rudder pedals, scared to death when that door pops open. Of course, in a 152, it's really hard to calm them down. You simply tell them, "Do you know how much trouble you had getting into this thing? You're not going to fall out of it that easily." So it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? So don't turn an abnormal situation into an emergency, and that's being prepared for everything. One of the big problems that we have. In, as pilots, and we're, big, we're guilty of this, we all know, is being distracted. And it's easy to get distracted, isn't it? And that's why even when you're going for your check ride for any rating, it's required that the examiner distract you because it's going to happen to you in the airplane. 1978, Portland, Oregon, guys flying this DC-8 got an abnormal gear extension warning. And what happened? You remember? They got to concentrating so much on the problem, they literally fuel, flew that aircraft out of fuel and crashed. Right here in Florida, home of Sun and Fun. Do you remember that incident where all that flight three required flight crew members on the deck of that professional aircraft? And they all got to focusing on the three green lights and whether or not the gear was down and locked at night. It's believed that somewhere during the course of this, someone bumped the yoke, either the captain or first officer, and that aircraft began a slow descent into the Florida Everglades, killing almost everybody on board. We all can be distracted. It's easy to get distracted. A more positive note, it's so easy to get distracted. Let's show you. Here, it, it just, it's terribly easy to, to, to get somebody distracted, and the results are usually not too good. <laughs> I told you it was easy to get distracted, didn't I? And ma'am, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you laughing because I showed this clip in Southern California and there's a woman waiting in the parking lot to whoop me over this. She said, you think that's funny, don't you? Now, it's critical. Remember, does that situation that happened to you in the aircraft, whether it was distraction or not, does it require immediate action? 
think about this. There's big, if you have an engine failure in 172 at 8,000 feet, that's a whole different ball, ball game than happening at 500 feet, isn't it? You've got time to deal with the problem. In-flight fires, boy, that's a scary thing. What about these uh, loss of cabin pressure? See, that's another good thing about a Cessna 152. I have never had a loss of cabin pressure in that airplane. And remember, do you remember what to do? That's a critical thing. How many of you remember those old bold items in your checklist? There's a reason they're bold. What are you supposed to do to those? Memorize them. But how many of us really do that after a period of time? We study up for those check rides or a flight review. We're all guilty of this. But then you're not prepared. You're not studying those things. We forget over a period of time how much we forget. So take the time. I know a couple of folks who actually carry a copy of the pilot operating handbook for their aircraft with them all the time. When they get, when we're always waiting in lines or getting stuck somewhere. And, and it's just a good idea to pull that out and review those every once in a while because we never know when it's going to happen to us. Here's one for you. I want you to think fast. I'm right, I want you to holler this out, you participate here, I want you to tell me what you do under this emergency I'm about to give to you, okay? Quick, your only engine just quit, 500 feet AGL on takeoff, and you got water ahead, what do you do? Nose down. Nose down. Oh, you're, these folks are on the ball here in Florida, absolutely. Yeah, one of the first things you want to do, the number one job of a pilot is to what? Fly the aircraft, exactly, and you don't want this thing to stall. That is a critical, important thing to do. But remember, it is, it is easy to get in trouble and find out at these low-altitude emergencies that you may not be prepared as much as you think you are. Let me give you an example, and this is a great one, especially if there's flight instructors in the room with us today, a good one to show to somebody if you're going to give them a flight review, to show you, do you really know your aircraft as well as you think you do? How many people here in our studios have fly single-engine airplanes? Most of the folks are raising their air hands in here. That's you know, probably a no-brainer that you do. But do you really know what your aircraft's capable of doing? Let me give you a quick scenario. You go over to an air park somewhere where your buddy's flying around, and, and you know it's a relatively short strip, especially in the summertime when density altitude's up, but you've had no trouble in the past getting in and out of the aircraft, he, or that airport. He wants you to fly over there, have lunch with him, maybe play around the golf, whatever the case may be. So you go over to that particular airport and visit with him. You say, well, it's time to go back home. You go back to the airplane. You pre-flight it well. Everything looks good. Hop in the airplane, taxi down the taxiway, do a run-up in the run-up area. Everything looks good there, too. And then you say, well, it's time to go. You do give your, your little Unicom call that you're departing the runway. Taxi out there, firewall the throttle, and you start your takeoff roll. And you're barreling down that relatively short runway. The nose is coming up. You're at rotation speed, and all of a sudden, something happens. Something happens that you make the determination you have to abort the takeoff. You hear something you don't like. Or maybe you just happen to glance down at the instruments at that moment and see the oil pressure gauge go slamming over to zero. You decide you're going to abort that takeoff. Here's the question for you. How much total runway are you going to use in that aborted takeoff scenario? Do you know in your airplane? Is this information directly printed in the pilot operating handbook of most single engine airplanes in the United States? No, it's not. Shows up in a few light twins, the guys who fly the heavy iron, depending on the make and model, it's called stopping distance or whatever, but it's not directly printed. You have to go back and do some adding to determine that information. You have to take the ground roll for the takeoff phase of flight, because you've used that up, you're at rotation speed, right? The ground roll for the takeoff phase under those environmental conditions out of that pilot operating handbook, you've got to turn right around and add those to what? the ground roll for the landing phase of flight. Because if you're at rotation speed in that configuration, aren't you almost right back in the same configuration you're in when you're landing? Folks, you go add those two numbers together and you, and you add into that the Air Safety Foundation recommendation of putting 50% to those numbers because of human reaction time and other factors, and you may be surprised at how much total runway you use. I was talking about this particular scenario in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Had a military trained pilot there who was really, he, he said, man, I'm a stickler for detail. And he came up to me after the seminar and he said, you know, you got me thinking. And I ran out to my car during the break and I carry a POH with me for my airplane. And I got my calculator out. And he said, you know what, I used to pride myself in doing a really good briefing to myself before I ever took off an airplane. 
And you got me realizing I left out a very important question under that scenario. And I said, what's that question? He said, what's the best two uh, trees I need to go between at the other end of this airport because there's not enough runway under back and board to take off scenario if that happened to me. See, that's thinking outside the box to be prepared for anything that may happen. And these kind of thoughts and challenges and, and uh, approach to training and thinking about those things can make you a lot safer pilot. You can't get out there at that altitude and hand prop the thing like this guy might be trying. That's a dedicated aircraft and plant mechanic. You know, my wife is an AMP. I don't think she'd attempt to do that in flight, but this is a dedicated person. Training, that's the key. Be prepared. Under that scenario I just gave you, you've got to remember that some emergencies require that we be prepared right then, while others we've got the time to pull out the checklist and determine what those emergencies are, right? So train for these, anticipate them, and make sure this may change your whole approach to the pre-takeoff brave uh, uh, scenarios and how you brief yourself on those. Our number one job, again, is to aviate, to fly the aircraft, and then we navigate and communicate. Unfortunately, with all the great technology showing up in airplanes, that in itself is becoming a distraction, isn't it? Be careful about that. Be well trained so that operation of that new equipment is second nature and not the priority of what we're doing in the airplane. Now, sometimes we cause the problem. You ever done something? You know, one of the things we want to emphasize to you, I don't care how many people in here are pilots, if you've been flying for any length of time at all, we've all done something, haven't we? May not have been life threatening, but we've all done something. And sometimes it becomes one of those, you're too embarrassed to share it with anybody else in the airplane. You ever switch to the empty tank or something that happens all the time? Or what about this? You ever had the wrong Mr. Prop throttle setting or something and you, you goof it up? Or reach, reach over to grab the throttle and grab the mixture instead? It's happened. Matter of fact, a good friend of mine was on a, his uh, private pilot check ride. And you talk about a unique scenario. He was going for his private pilot check ride with a brand new designated examiner that was giving his first official check ride. So you got two nervous people on board this aircraft trying to make it work. When he was trying to it simulate the engine out scenario, instead of reaching over there and grabbing the throttle he pulled it out, he reached over and grabbed the mixture and actually did shut down the engine on the guy. And I asked him, he says, because he called me and said, man, what a ride. And I said, well, what did you do? He said, I hit his arm. And I told him, don't you touch that again. And he said, I passed my private pilot check ride. <laughs> <laughs> so that works, doesn't it? So, and remember airframe configurations. You ever put the uh, flaps down a little too early? These things happen to us when we're flying around. Those memory items, already I'm emphasizing that again. Make sure you remember those things are important. They're in bold on that checklist. And another thing we want to emphasize is talk to somebody. This is critical, folks. Um, I cannot tell you, one of the things that just surprised me when I started doing safety seminars about 10 years ago, that how many times I get into an area where some pilots tell me that I'm just extremely reluctant to declare an emergency. I don't know where that comes from. Matter of fact, there's two, I'm finding there's two critical types of far different personality traits in pilots. There's those who will just, and they'll tell you, I'm never going to use that E word. I'm not going to open up my log books for the FAA to investigate by declaring an emergency. I'm going to do everything I can first, and then and only then will I ask for help. That's sad, because that is a very dangerous way to look at it. And on the other side of the fence is a whole group of pilots that they don't even have their emergency training supplemented enough, or they don't do it enough because they look at 121.5 as OnStar. You know, all we got to do is go to 121.5 and they're there to help. You know, I've locked my keys in my plane. What, can y'all push the button and open the door? It's not like that. There's a middle of the road in there. Those second group of folks who just are reluctant to declare an emergency, I don't know where that, or they just um, think that they can just talk their way out of it. And I do know, I know how it is. You walk around Sunday and fun, folks in this room, Pilots are great communicators. We love to talk. We love to hang or fly. Talk about airplanes. Talk about flying. But you just can't talk yourself out of everything. In fact, I don't know anybody as great a communicator as pilots are that can talk themselves out of everything. Well, I, I take that back. I do know one person. The only way I, reason I thought about this is because flying down, I came over. Anybody here ever heard of a place called Livonia, Georgia, up near the 
uh, South Carolina, Georgia line. I have an aunt there named Mabel. Now that is a 92-year-old a, a Southern lady that can talk herself out of anything. I'll tell you how I know that. I live in Clayton, North Carolina, East of Raleigh, and she came up to visit my son and me uh, several, about a year ago this happened. And the way I heard it, when she was leaving town, she's got a huge Cadillac. She was 91 years old then, and she was leaving our home driving through Clayton, and she got pulled by a Clayton police officer going 78 in a 45. And the officer got up there and said, um, now, you know, this is a skilled lady communicator. And she got up to the, to the cop car, and, and the cop got there, and he said, ma'am, can I see your driver's license? She said, I ain't got one. He said, well, ma'am, how about the registration for your car? She said, I stole this car from a man I shot five miles back. <laughs> now, this officer said, I don't care how old this lady is. She's crazy. And he backed up and called for backup. And so they sent his sergeant over. He told the sergeant back away what happened. He went to the car and said, Ma'am, I understand you don't have a driver's license. She said, Well, I do, officer. Here it is. He said, Well, ma'am, I understand you don't have the registration for this car or that you stole this car. She said, well, I've had this car for 15 years. Here's the registration. He said, Ma'am, my officer told me you told him you didn't have a driver's license and you stole this car from a man you shot. She said, Huh? <gasps> I bet that liar said I was speeding too, didn't he? <laughs> now maybe she could have talked herself out of everything, but we can't do that. Let's talk about some specific emergency. When everybody here, you ready? Holler out. When you think and, and put the position of most pilot, single engine pilots in the United States, when you think of an emergency, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Anybody want to say it? Say it. Engine failure is usually the number one answer we get. So with that in mind, let's talk about uh, some scenarios for that. Most of us are taught if you're at a fairly low altitude, taking off an airport, and you have a low altitude engine failure, you may be taught certain things. Most of us, you know, the best thing to do is to have a controlled crash straight ahead than to try to turn the airplane. But thanks to the folks at Microsoft Flight Simulator, which is a pretty accurate depiction, especially in the 172, of what the airplane does, we stuck a fella in there, didn't tell him what, what the system was set up to do, and Toronto was a great airport because that big body of water if you're taking off in that direction towards Toronto, uh, had it programmed to fail the engine at 500 AGL, and it was 65 degree day, and full fuel on board, five knot headwind, and say, if you did have engine failure, we want you to try to make it back to the airport no matter what your altitude is. So here's what happened. Gave him a 15 degree bank so you can go up to that, 30 degree bank, 45 degree bank, and a 70 plus degree bank. Under those scenarios, Raise your hand. Do any of you think this guy at 500 feet was able to make it back to the airport from where he departed? Under any of scenario? No hands going up. Well, let's go and take you into the, uh, the actual recording here, the Microsoft Flight Simulator. Here comes the engine failure. A little uh, difficult to see the gauges sometimes, but if you can see that, this pilot did a good job of establishing the best glide speed, but he's got a 15-degree bank going on here. What's the problem? He's not making the turn fast enough, so this is becoming a lot more than a 180 degree turn, isn't it? Trying to make it back to the airport. So this guy's pretty sharp here. He's trying to do his best to maintain the fly in the aircraft and still make that turn we told him to make. But he realizes there's no way he's gonna make this back to the airport. So this is kind of neat. He decides, well, since I've got to ditch the aircraft, you certainly want wings level with that. So the wing levels the wings and it makes it into the water. So, you know, that was how. Now let's go, let's add a little bank here to see if we can help him get back to the airport. In this particular case, let's go to 30 degrees of bank and let's see what happens in this case. Again, here comes the engine failure. He's establishing best glide speed. He's got a little bit more going for him in the what? He's making the turn a little bit quicker at this altitude. Now as he makes that turn, you'll see that he is turning a little bit quicker. He's got that advantage. There's the body of water. He's still, still got some altitude to work with here, considering there the, uh, the field elevation in Toronto. And at 12 o'clock, there's the airport. So he's trying to do a little bit. If you go back to the panel shot here, he's trying to glide, stretch this glide as much as he possibly can. Look at this. You talk about one lucky dude. Now look, but Microsoft people said, this isn't safe, you shouldn't do that. So look what happens to him. It causes him to flip the airplane to punish him for trying to make that turn. Now, having seen that, are any of you changing your mind about the possibility of making it back to the airport with maybe a 45 degree bank 
Anybody want to? Oh, I see some confident folks changing their mind here. So let's go back and see this scenario. Here comes the engine failure right there. And he's making the turn. The advantage here is a lot steeper turn and bank. And he's trying to get back to that airport area. Let's see what happens. He's got some advantages here having made that turn a lot quicker. There's the runway he departed from. It is 12 o'clock. Got a little five knot headwind before us. So he's got a five knot tailwind in this case. The pie's going so slow, the prop stops turning. And look at this. There's the stall horn, and bam, he's on the runway. How about that? He did make it. Now, does this mean that the Air Safety Foundation is going out on a limb and telling you, we expect you to do that? But no, I don't want to even show you the 70-degree bank uh, scenario because don't do that. You're too much at a risk of stalling and spinning the airplane to attempt that. But I can tell you this, there's a lesson here into really, again, knowing your aircraft, right? What's wrong with going up with a competent instructor? and going at altitude and setting you a hard level altitude that simulates that, um, that field elevation in your airport and seeing what your airplane will do under that scenario. And then when you determine at what altitude you can safely make a 45 degree bank turn to get back to the airport, then what do you want to do? You certainly want to add a couple of hundred feet at least margin of safety to that, considering the winds and everything else. And then you'll know, you'll know exactly at what altitude precisely you would even be willing to do a 180 degree turn to get back to the airport. Of course, the other thing you want to remember, why are we saying add at least a couple of hundred feet, maybe even 500 if you can to that scenario? Because in real life, your reaction time may be different. Uh, sometimes you may have fire or smoke in the cockpit, oil in the windscreen. All of these can change uh, your reaction time and what you're doing in that aircraft, so you want to have a margin of safety. But remember, a lot of times people have warning that during pre-flights or even noise or vibration in the engine that there's something wrong. You'll be surprised to me pilots say, will confess after an engine failure that they did sense something but they chose to ignore it. They chose, well, I'll just, and why are we like that? This is human factors at work again. Any of us over 40, you remember our first cars? Man, that was an amazing thing, wasn't it? I don't know about you, but my first car was um, a Volkswagen that I paid $75 for that looked like it had been in a meteor shower. I mean, there were dents on the top of the driver's side of the top of the car. And asked the guy, this kind of hippie fellow in North Carolina I bought it from, I said, where'd that come from? He said, I don't know, it was there when I bought it. You remember we getting those earlier cars? Today they all drive new cars. It blows my mind when I go by Clayton High School in North Carolina. Everybody's got new cars. I was one of only seven people at New Hanover High School in Wilmington, North Carolina. I grew up, we even had a car, so nobody made fun of it like they would today. But you'd be driving down the road in those old cars, you remember that? And just tick, 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 did something happen? Would we pull over and stop and investigate when something like that happened? No. We keep going to see if it's going to do it again. That's human nature. You ever hit something in the road? Watch somebody when they drive over like a, a big stick of gum or something in the road and it gets on the tire and they'll hit that thing and then thump, 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 thump in the car. They don't pull over. They're just expecting a miraculous healing of that tire to take place and we just keep on trucking. Isn't that something? I'm sorry, I'm bringing back memories of my first car and, and the fact that nobody made fun of it. Matter of fact, the only question anybody asked me was, Mark, where'd you get $75? You know, that cost a lot of money back then. I, I was honest with him. I told him, I said, you remember back at Chestnut Junior High School, we used to play spin the bottle? They said, oh, yeah. I said, you remember that rule we had that if the bottle landed on you and, and the girl didn't want to kiss you, she had to give you a dime? Well, I saved up $75 in dimes and bought that car. So if you wonder where that money came from, that's it. So what do you do? What about this scenario? Partial power loss. You ever had that happen to you? Now, one of the first things you want to check for in, in these uh, normally aspirated engines is what? Carburetor ice, that's right. And you want to check that and make sure that's not the culprit. But it could be other problems involved. If this happened to you, be careful. The engine's probably running rough. And one of the worst things you can do is do what we normally do in a car. If we feel like the engine's about to stall on us, we'll start, man, slamming that gas pedal to the floor, trying to catch it. 
Don't do that. If you try to firewall the throttle under this scenario, whatever problems is may be exasperated for that and get worse. So make minor baby changes to the throttle to see if you can kind of smooth that engine out. If it doesn't happen, once you get to the best setting possible, what you need to be doing now, getting that airplane on the ground, find an airport, and prepare just in case on the trip over there for a total power loss in the airplane. Here's a scary one, smoke in the cockpit. I tell you, that's a scary scenario, sometimes even worse than an engine fire when you got smoke actually coming in and limiting your uh, ability to see. Assess the problem. If you can find out if it's coming from a radio or something, cut it off. You may need to kill the electrical system. Whatever you need to do, try to stop it. And even if you stop it, get on the ground as soon as possible. Air, airborne fires are scary too. Uh, you can isolate the source. You can certainly tell if it's an electrical fire, in many cases even by the smell or where it's coming from. Isolate the source and if it's an engine fire, you want to shut down the engine. You don't have a choice but to get back on the ground as soon as you possibly can. And this is where this training comes in again. When was the last time we were up, even on a flight review, and practiced side slips, trying to extinguish an engine fire, or emergency descents? See a lot of pilots doing that in preparation for the commercial pilot check ride, but not a lot of us do that as a routine practice on a flight review. Something else you want to put to your checklist for your next flight review. Vacuum failures. This is a scary thing. If it happens in VMC, no big deal. In IMC, it's a whole different ball game. And guess what? And I don't want to take away from our next seminar that's coming up here at Sun and Fun at 1130, but I'll tell you this, I will let you know this. Do you know if you're in a single pilot IFR operation in IMC conditions and your vacuum pumps fail, statistically you're going to die. How can you fix that? Well, there's a tease for you to come back to our next seminar. It is a bona fide emergency and a large percentage of these vacuum failure accidents are fatal. The fix, as you're going to learn during our single pilot IFR seminar, is so simple most pilots don't want to believe it, but you can substantially increase your chances of surviving by doing one little trick we're going to tell you about in the next seminar. Backup systems are good, but you're going to see in that little trick that that doesn't always keep you from getting in trouble. And plus, practicing partial panel skills helps, but it's not the number one way to try to keep from getting in trouble. Lost communications, especially if you're IMC, remember there's a whole section in the regulations and in the aeronautical information manual on what to do. There's a little homework for you. Don't have the time today since this is a one-hour version of a two-hour seminar to give you all the details, but go back. I'm more challenging to go back and look some of these things up. Handheld radios are great too. In fact, a lot of pilots are realizing that they can uh, have little headset adapters to make them even better. And you can use any resources in addition to the adapter, an external antenna to that radio, just have a little BNC connector in the cockpit that you can plug into in the event you need to use. The handheld radio helps in uh, getting the signal in and out a little bit better. And what about this? What about your cell phone? Now I know the regulations say that you don't use your cell phone inside of an aircraft. It's not supposed to be legal. But guess what folks? There's one there's situations where the rules go out the window. Because if you have to and that's the only way you can get help, use it. I remember talking to a fellow mentioning that. He said he lost all of his electrical system, IMC. He said, I could hear fairly decent on my um, cell phone. He actually called directory assistance and talked the directory assistant operator into how to find in the, in the blue pages the number for the TRACON, called him up, and they were able to help him out in the air, get him on the ground. And he said he knew it wasn't technically legal, but guess what? We have a saying in North Carolina, folks, I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by 6. And so the point is, if you need help, get it. Whatever, control locks. I've seen a guy at my home base airport take off with the tow bar on the airplane. I've seen people take off with control locks. Something about the pre-flight nature, and boy, that's scary. Cables, you remember this, uh, the very light jet accident recently where they were doing the test flying for that aircraft and find out something happened and misrigged the cables on some adjustments? And that fast-moving aircraft, you can imagine, with this test pilot on board, wasn't able to determine what the problem was quick enough, and now we've lost that plane and, and that pilot. So try anything and everything, but better yet, good training to get there. Uh, airframe damage or failure is rare. But uh, even if something like that happens, again, try anything, but don't forget that number one job is still flying the aircraft. You'll hear people who've gotten out of trouble will tell you that was their number one thing. Landing gear problems, the good news is it's rare that anybody gets hurt 
during landing gear failure. Now the pilot's ego is pretty damaged, but the airplane survives and of course there's a lot of damage to the aircraft itself. Remember this incident that took place on the, um, it's amazing when you watch these incidents. Take, they were, um, I remember the network I was watching, I, I spent 22 years in the broadcast business folks and I can tell you, it just drives me crazy when I see them cover aviation stories. It's like they were hoping something would happen to this airplane as to why they were covering it live and that's another reason we got to be careful when we're out there flying around, remember? Because if we do something silly in airplane, there's folks out there watching us. Remember the SAG Washington ADIS incursion? Sure those pilots, you talk to them, they admit it was crazy for that to happen. But what was scarier was how the news covered it. Did they say two pilots goofed up and got in trouble today? No, the network I was watching, the first video clip came on and what was it? They were showing people running out of the Pentagon, out of the uh, Capitol building. And you know what the aircraft was? A Cessna 150. Folks, they evacuated the Capitol building over a Cessna 150. This is an airplane you'd have to dive straight down to tear up a bedroom on a double wide, and these folks evacuated the Capitol building over that. Now, I'm not saying the Capitol Police were wrong. Folks, they're on this level of alert. They just don't want something to happen on their watch. But the bottom line is we got to be extra careful in this post-9-11 environment to fly as safely as we can and not make mistakes because they're trying to turn it into the most negative take on aviation that they can. If you do have a bona fide emergency, now some people say you got to be kidding, don't panic. But guess what? Do you know here's some good news about how the human mind works. You talk to pilots who've been in full-blown emergencies, got some good news for you. Most people get most nervous after it's over. There's something that just takes over in us, and they, it becomes, you talk to them, they said it was almost surreal, or I was reacting, and you know how they were reacting? The way that they were trained, and there's proof to that, so don't panic. Ever took off with your seatbelt hanging out of one side? I confess to this. See, we all make mistakes. I took one of our television reporters up on traffic watch with me. I did traffic watch in Raleigh, North Carolina for, for 10 years and in that 152, and he wanted to go flying with me. After we got in the air, I ended up with this 15-minute music sweep where I wasn't doing traffic reports. He said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I need to get back to the studio. Can we land? I said, man, i got to get you in and out pretty quick. Go back to the airport. I didn't fly to Raleigh-Durham Airport, but a, a general aviation airport nearby. And I got him out of the airplane. I thought I had everything taken care of. I said, take care, man. Slam that door, and I took taxiing down the runway to take off. And you know what? There's something interesting about seat belts hanging out, especially with 152. It doesn't do anything to left you airborne. And so once I get in the air, I start hearing this bam, bam, bam. I said, oh my God, he's still on the strut. I didn't know what was going on, but fortunately I realized what it was and pulled. So don't overreact to these things. Same like pilots report, no communications. Realize they just didn't plug the headset in adapter strong enough. Do you know passengers can cause problems on board aircraft? Did you know that? You'll be surprised how often this happens. Sometimes there are people over on the ground waiting for you that can cause problems. Please be careful about that because it can happen to you. Air sickness can be an issue, children, uh, physiological needs, me genuine medical emergencies. I got to look at this picture they sent us for this seminar and I looked real closely at it and I said, Lee, what's scary about this picture? Look closely at this boy's hands. He's flown with his dad before. <laughs> Do you see that? <laughs> no, I'm just, I just thought, my, he's got on a life jacket. He's got his fingers crossed. They've overdosed this poor child on drama meme, and he's in there. But really, these things can happen to you on board aircraft. You got to be careful about it, and because they can, it's easy. It's easy for somebody in the airplane to distract you. And I know. And look, I, I, you know what? It's funny when people who don't fly complain about another pilot. Anybody want to have a clue what the number one complaint is? turbulence. And like we got something to do with that. But in reality they will make some sense. They'll say, you know, but when I was on the airline at least the captain came on board and he said, uh, hey, you know, sorry about the turbulence. We're trying to find some smooth air. He talked to us. Remember that folks, if a passenger on board the airplane is getting nervous even for no reason in your mind, it's a reason in their mind. Do you know that can make you nervous too? Now I know, now I'll back you up on this. If you've been flying any length of time at all, you probably had somebody on the airplane with you you don't like, and you don't care if they were terrified. But we don't want that to happen to us. We want people to be nice. I hate to confess where this happened to me, but seeing this boy in this picture reminded that this, this happened, believe it or not, in a Young Eagles event. Anybody here fly Young Eagles? 
I'm glad to see those hands go up. Folks, that's the McDonald's of aviation. You win kids over, you got the parents. It's a great program. And this happened to me at the Young Eagles event. Now, I wasn't a kid. I took a 10-year-old girl for her first airplane ride. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. And I, you, All of you fly, fly Young Eagles, you know that they all love it. But there's some kids that really love it. That was this beautiful little 10-year-old girl. I felt so proud. I kept her up longer. And she, she had the best demeanor of any child I'd ever met in my life. Kept telling my, telling my son, hang around with her, you know. He's a good boy, but she was great. And I took her for the flight. And when we got back to the airport, she said, got out of the 152, gave me a hug, made me feel like a million bucks. That's another reason I like flying Young Eagles. It's one of the few times I have air, people in the airplane with me that are my size. And she gave me a big old hug, and she hopped out of the airplane, and she goes, walking away. And she comes back, and she said, Mr. Martin. I said, yeah. She said, will you take Mommy for a ride? And I said, honey, we normally don't do that here at these events, but I, I, you know what? I, uh, just for you, because you've been one of the best young eagles I've had in a long time, I'll take your, your mom up. And she said, thanks. And she ran to get her mom. And I hadn't met her mom. And she comes out of the hangar, a little staging area. Went, Folks, I don't know where that wonderful young girl got her demeanor from, but it wasn't from that woman. <laughs> she came out of the hangar fussing at me. She said, uh, now remember, this is an airport, Johnston County Airport, North Carolina, East of Raleigh, near Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. And it was built in the 40s. And she comes out and she says, hey, how, did you rich people with your flying machines get us to build an airport? What do we need an airport in this county for? And before I could even answer, she said, another thing. Who was the one that let them announce in the schools they were giving free airplane rides to kids today? Do you know how tough it was for us to get up and bring them out here without them driving us crazy over this? And another thing, she wants me to go on that thing. I don't want to, but if I don't, she'll keep me up at 2 o'clock in the morning and tell me about it over and over and over again. But this time I'm looking at her like this, you know, I'm thinking this is going to be a very brief flight. And I got the woman in the airplane, and folks going down the taxiway, she's still fussing. I kept having it the isolate switch on the intercom, because every time I went to Bo, she said, another thing. And I thought, I was really starting to get tense, and if you don't think passengers can affect you, they can. And so why, even when I took off, I shouldn't even tell you this, but when I got in the air, I was actually wondering, if you're in the air, are you in Johnston County Sheriff's Department jurisdiction? <laughs> Can you, you know, hit the woman and get away with it or what? So I'm coming around, and we're on downwind, going base, and we're going down, you know. And finally, when we're on downwind, here she is fussing. And by this time, I'm just about to say, ma'am, you're about to be quiet. But I kept thinking about that little girl. I'm doing it for her. We get over those trees in the summertime, those pine trees. What happened? <clears throat> little bump, right? Got that heat, those thermals. And right in the middle of this fussing, she goes, Bleh! she said, what was that? And I said, we hit a dog. Now, don't do that. We want them to like us. You know, it was, I should, it was kind of personally entertaining to watch her, though, because when I said we hit a dog, what'd she do? She went, you know. <laughs> I wish I thought faster on my feet because I said, yeah, that Airedale back there. Did you see that? But I didn't know, think about that. So don't let a passenger emergency become an aircraft emergency. Let me tell you something else. Do you know, to prove to you that you will react the way you're trained, let's go to the folks who have to have the most training, airline pilots and the professional military pilots that are out there. Now, NASA, along with other airlines, worked on a safety deal like at Moffett Field, and the results were amazing. When they threw at these professional, well-trained, cockpit crews for these airlines, when they flew through routine emergencies at them, ones that they studied for and practiced for in training, that in 96% of the cases, they did exactly what they were supposed to do when that emergency took place. But when they threw emergencies that were outside the box, weird stuff they normally didn't take training for inside the simulator training, they were handled poorly. So what's the moral to this? That just taking the training, the, the cookie cutter approach to when we're learning to fly may not be good enough, right? We need to think outside the box consistently. Most designated examiners, when they held you that new private pilot certificate when you got it and you were proud of that thing, what did most of them say? This is a license to learn. And it really is. We're all always learning and that's extremely important. You know what? You talk about things that you just never think would happen to you in an airplane. How many of you heard about the West Virginia snake guy? 
We were hoping to get him on videotape before the seminar, so we couldn't. He did send us some pictures, and we talked to him on the telephone. You talk about having something happen to your airplane that doesn't normally happen. This guy had it. Let's watch and hear what happened to him. I'm Lonnie Coles, Charleston, West Virginia, and I learned firsthand the other day about maintaining your concentration on flying an airplane, regardless of what is happening around you. On an instrument scan, I noticed this little head appear in a small hole at the top of the instrument panel. Looking around for something to either cover the hole or grab it, and it came out about four inches and wiggled its tongue at me, so I grabbed my sporty's handheld radio and just smacked it real hard, which sent batteries flying all over the cabin. Fell down through the instrument panel onto my feet, and I was kicking like mad. It felt a lot heavier than what I expected, and I thought, well, open the door and get one side it can get out. And before I could get to the door handles, it had shot across the floor and up the door and, and I just grabbed him by the neck and held on for bare life. I was squeezing his neck, he wrapped around my arm, he reaches down with his tail and wraps around the uh, flap handle and was pulling on it. I thought it did occur to me, you know, if I crashed and uh, Destroyed the plane and myself, and the snake slithered out somewhere. There wouldn't be any evidence of a snake or a problem that had occurred. When that head first appeared, I thought, what am I going to do? And my uh, instructor's voice from 25 or so years ago, Benny Mallory, came back to me, said, whatever happened, fly the plane, fly the plane. And he still grounds that into people. And by the way, I'm within about three or four miles of Gallopolis, and there was a bunch of planes uh, doing touch and goes. I said, I appreciate a priority on runway five or a straight in. I got a problem. And I proceeded and landed, taxied up to the pumps. And after a few pictures, one of them said, uh, you know, the landing you made, you ought to take that snake with you all the time. I really never thought anything like this would happen to me. I said, you know what? There's two big lessons from this West Virginia snake fellow, they had the snake in the airplane. One was that he did one of the best landings he ever made having that snake on board. You know what? Sometimes it puts us an extra added level of alert, doesn't it? The other thing was he didn't think anything like that would ever happen to him. So there's a moral to that story in being careful. Know when to call it quits. Know when to put the airplane even on the ground. You know what? This is another area where we might be goofing up in the training of pilots. Because think about the scenario. Anybody in here officially, now I know we're all always learning, but officially, we have any student pilots in the group right today? None at all? Usually we have at least one. But you know, remember your student pilot days. What was the preparation for that uh, precautionary landing? Or when you lost an engine and you had to get the airplane on the ground, what happened? Your instructor reached over there, grabbed that throttle, pulled it up, you just lost your engine, what are you going to do? And so you set up and got pretty good about finding a field, didn't you, and getting close to that field. And as you got close to it, it looked like you were going to make it. Then what happened? Oh, great, we're out of here. You got full power and you're climbing out. What's missing here? You know what? With all of these most runways in the United States, 3,000 foot plus paved strips, we have a whole generation of pilots who've never done anything but take off and land on pavement. And I've had pilots tell me stories when I'm on the road where their best bet to get out of a situation would have been to get the airplane back on the ground at that point with an off-airport landing, and yet they didn't do it. Why? Because they told me I've never really done it before. You know, I got close, and Martin thought, why didn't my instructor let me land on some kind of unpaved runway one day? because I don't even know what it feels like. Did he not do it because parts are going to fly off the airplane or whatever? They're just scared. If you fall in that category, I highly encourage you at least once to get with an instructor and take off and land out of a non-paved runway somewhere so you know what it feels like if you ever have to make that decision to get the airplane on the ground. It's a great safety thing that can keep you out of trouble. You know what? The good news is this. 53% of forced landings involve no injuries. So the, the odds are in your favor, despite your fear of having to do that, and that you're going to survive. I hate the word only 9%, because if you're in that 9% category, it's devastating if somebody gets killed. But most, even pilots think 
st statistically the fatality rate is higher than this. So the chances are you're going to make it on the ground with either minor injuries or none at all if you have to make a forced landing. Finding a field GPS helps out here too, but remember it's a great tool, but if you don't pre-fly if you don't get the, all the information, sometimes GPS keeps us from doing that, we kind of over depend on the information there, then the GPS may not be the most accurate tool. Good example, if you don't check the winds off, you just take off and fly, because you got all the information in the GPS, and all of a sudden something happens and you need to get back on the ground. If you hit that nearest airport feature, let's say it says the nearest airport is nine miles east, and the next nearest airport is 18 miles west. But if you got head wind or winds out of the east coming to you at uh, maybe 45 or 50 knots, what's really the next nearest airport? See, that's really important to know the details on this. Getting back on the ground, the slower is better, but not too slow, and aim for the soft stuff. And remember this, Bob Hoover said it best, fly the thing as far into the crash as possible. Now, that sounds funny, but the key is you're supposed to control the airplane even after touchdown. Hold on to the aircraft and don't let go. A lot of people get hurt by just letting go of the aircraft after it hits the ground because it startles them a little bit. You don't want to do that. Nighttime, don't like what you see at night? Close your eyes. No, don't do that. Here's what you want to do. I want to warn you about something. The nighttime accident rate in general aviation is not great. And yet, the solution to this, again, a simple solution, a lot of people don't want to believe it, but this is it. Don't ever, ever, ever take off or land, especially out of a non-towered airport at night that you've never been in and out of that airport before without talking to someone who has. It's knowing the tricks of the trade, terrain, and information around that airport that gets pilots in, in trouble. Belts and harnesses tight. Well, make sure that's good. Seats in locked position. Talk to your passengers. Remember, they could be really very nervous, and it will help you, too, to talk to them about what's going on. Don't forget to pop the doors, too, and some of those latches on, the, like the 172, you can actually open the door and then re-engage that latch to keep the door from sticking in. Little extra tricks of the trade. But even if you have to make these decisions in flight, remember the important thing to do is to fly the airplane. Finding you on the ground just after you land, fly a flight plan, that helps. And stay with or near the aircraft, it's easier to find them. And don't over depend on the ELTs, by the way. 97% uh, have false alarms. It's better to go ahead and do that and, uh, and, and make sure you know where you are so you can talk to somebody and get help. There's new ELTs coming out, cell phones help you find it, all these things. You'll never be totally ready for an emergency, but you can substantially increase your chance of surviving if you practice because you're going to react the way that you're trained, mentally rehearse these things and stay situationally aware about where you are. Most pilot emergencies result from poor decisions. Good examples, engine failure. You know that fuel exhaustion is still the number one cause. Three times a week in aviation, it's our fault. You know what? You make better decisions, you have better odds of surviving. I tell you what, I hope you leave here today with a little bit better preparedness. This is just to wet your whistle, hopefully, about going out there and getting additional training, changing your attitude about the flight review to prepare for emergencies so that you're a safer pilot. One more quick note since we're almost out of time here. Remember this, folks. Folks are watching us in this 9-11 post environment here that we live in. And if they meet you and find out you're a pilot, they think all pilots are like you. The number one cause of our attitude in the cockpit of an airplane that can get us in trouble is also the number one attitude that can make people not like us in general public and hurt our fight to remain free to fly in this, in this country. And that attitude is arrogance. Please keep that in check. If people like us, they're going to be willing to stand behind us and protect our freedom to fly. I know it means a lot on a beautiful day here in Florida. For those of you watching at home on the internet, it is beautiful here. And I'll tell you, it's really amazing that these folks came inside and sat in on a safety seminar. It speaks a lot about their character. They did that. It speaks a lot about your character if you're sitting at home and watching this online. That you want to sit here and watch a seminar like this today. It says a lot about your character and that you're wanting to be safe. And we appreciate you doing that. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoy the rest of Sun and Fun. And we'll see you soon. We have our next seminar at 1130. Thank you. See you later.